Well, hello, everybody. My name is Roy Cohen. I'll be hosting this week's Community Forum show, uh, and I hope that uh, you're enjoying this uh, fantastic stretch of weather. Uh, when you're watching the show, hopefully it'll continue, and that your 4th of July weekend was a safe and ha happy one. And, uh, and now back to uh, business here. We have as our guest today, uh, Bob Juvenville. He's a, uh, a governor's counselor. And uh, for a little bit of history, he was born and raised in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And at the early age, he began to demonstrate his passion for helping others. By age 14, he was actively involved with the community through what is now known as the Boys and Girls Club of, Ho of Greater Holyoke. And this organization promotes the education, social involvement, and character development of boys and girls of all ages. He continues to support the Boys and Girls Club and other local charitable organizations. Uh, and uh, during the Vietnam era, uh, Bob served in the United States Army and he was sent to the USA Natick Lab as an experimental test subject. What is an experimental taste, uh, test subject, Bob? Well, in those days they were doing tests. There were 28 of us. Seven would come every six months, seven would leave. And they did tests on everything from medicines um, to cold weather gear, hot weather gear, um, underwater gear, um, all kinds of testing. Uh, they have a chamber that can bring you almost to the outer space and they would test medicines on you to see if you got sick, which you did usually. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, so they, they did a whole bunch of different climate uh, experiments in freezing water when they'd have our, us in freezing water mm -hmm. to see how long we could last without uh, having some sort of a problem with it. And you've obviously lasted. Uh, we made it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, very uncomfortable and I guess they have, they have since outlawed having soldiers forced, to, forced, to, forced to be tested. Oh, you were forced into this? It wasn't well, you a got two choices. You could either be court-martialed for refusing a test. Or do it. Or sent on the next plane to the jungles in Vietnam, where they said you'd lose your legs. So that's what we were told. So we didn't. We stayed where we were. That's it. I never knew they did that. Um, after your. Oh, by the way, welcome to the show. My pleasure. It's nice to always see you again. A pleasure. It's been a while, but uh, we always enjoy having you on. Always a pleasure. Um, after your uh, tour of duty with the Army, you then joined the Massachusetts State Police, served as a trooper, then as a detective receiving numerous commendations for being a good trooper. Yes. Excellent. Nice to hear. In working uh, days with the state police, you attended law school at night. Where did you go to law school? Suffolk University. Suffolk University. And then uh, when you graduated, you left the state police to begin a uh, career as a trial attorney, which was really your lifelong goal. Um, currently, you're one of only three board-certified criminal trial attorneys in Massachusetts. Yes. That sounds like, uh, w what's, what's different about being a board certified criminal trial attorney? Uh, every year you have to spend so many hours in front of a jury. You have to have so many judges in the system write letters on your behalf saying that you have the qualifications. Okay. Uh, so there's a higher standard of um, education. You gotta do so many courses every year, mm -hmm. those kind of things. And you're uh, admitted to practice in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, the U.S. Federal Court in Boston, and the Supreme Court yes. in Washington. You keep busy. Yeah, I try to. <laughs> you're successful at it. You have over 33 years of experience as a trial lawyer, which provides you with a keen sense of what makes a good judge. How does that lend itself to, what you, uh, to your present job as a uh, governor's counselor? Well, the council, one of the major things the council does is confirm judges to our court system. So the governor nominates people, which is a fancy word for referring, and we do the hiring as a governor's council. We either vote yes or no. So to me, um, I have been uh, uh, over 10,000 times before judges throughout this commonwealth. So. I get a pretty good sense of what I think makes a good judge mm -hmm. because my role on the council as I see it is to protect citizens from bad judicial appointments. So um, 
I bring with me my experience before judges and what I have over the years felt were good judges and those that I didn't think uh, were too good of judges. By a lot of ways, the way they treated people, their temperament, uh, the, the decisions that they made. Uh, the experience they had before they became a judge, all of that factors into how I vote on the council. How much time do you spend questioning a prospective judge? Um, I usually question, um, yesterday I think I questioned, we had two hearings, I think my questioning went for both of them about three hours. You? An hour and a half for each. What about the other counselors? Well, they question, some of them have no questions, some have short questions, some have more than that. I don't think anybody questions as much as I do. Uh, for the Chief Judge of the Supreme Judicial Court, Judge Gantz, I questioned him for three hours on different topics and mm -hmm. cases that he had been involved in. So for me, questioning is very important, much like a, a lawyer in a courtroom who cross-examines a witness. You try to bring out things and get a sense of how they would handle different things in a courtroom and what their philosophy is on, on certain things. One of the big topics today, and I've been doing it since I've been on the council, is the opiate epidemic throughout the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're dealing with that medical problem through our court system. We don't do any other medical problems other than this one. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately, it's in our court system, and you know the courts are designed to punish. So uh, basically, if a candidate for a judgeship says, I don't know anything about addictions, and there have been some. Or I question them and I realize that they're going to punish people with this disease because of just that fact that they have the disease. Mm -hmm. Then I don't vote for them. And I have made that publicly to the governor and lieutenant governor. Is that a, usually a majority vote when, they, when, you, when you vote for a person or don't vote for a person? Do the rest of the members go along with you? Yeah, some do and some don't. Uh, they all have their own. Um, ideas about what makes a good judge or how they should vote. I don't criticize anybody else's vote, even though I may disagree with them. Uh, that's, they're elected to the district they run in, and they answer to the people in their district. Does, do, um, do you get anything like uh, letters of recommendation, uh, uh, any history of prospective judges that you're able to check out before you make a decision? Oh, sure. Yeah, we get, um, uh, depending on the candidate, obviously, but yeah, we get we get letters from others. We get, I get calls all the time about people that have been nominated. Mm -hmm. uh, most of it is all positive stuff. Uh, but to me, uh, letters of recommendation and uh, calls about somebody being a good person and all of this stuff are fine. But at a hearing, they'll bring in witnesses, three or four witnesses, and they all say nice things about the candidate. Who brings, them, who brings in the witnesses? The nominee. Oh, of course. The person nominated will bring in people. Of course they're going to bring in people that say nice things. Of course. So that doesn't mean as much to me. I like hearing it. But I like to hear somebody coming in and say, well, this person did this or that. Some, you don't get a lot of people that come in against because they're usually lawyers and they don't want to stick their neck out if this person becomes a judge, you know. So they'll call you and give you some information and ask you to keep it you know, the, the confidentiality of their call. But I'm more interested in the candidate and, uh, of course, being in the courts for so long, I, I know a lot of people that are nominated. And I know what people say about them as lawyers. And I, I know what I say about them as lawyers. So uh, people will, will call me, but a lot of times I, I know the history of the person. Uh, yesterday, one of the candidates cited a case I had with her as an attorney, assistant attorney general. Um, so I, I get to see people and I get all feedback from the court system on a lot of these people. But I have learned that uh, picking judges is an, not a scientific uh, matter. Everybody that comes to the council says the right thing. Of course. They have listened to the tapes of the questions I've asked before, and they, I try to change them around, but they all, 
answer nicely and all of them will make wonderful judges in their minds. But I have found that some votes that I voted yes for, and I said this is a, make a wonderful judge, this person. About a month after this sitting, I start getting the calls. How the heck could you have voted for this person? Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, how did I miss something here? But I didn't. I have learned that when somebody gets a robe, the perceived power sometimes affects them. Goes to their head. In a negative way. The old saying in the army was, in the knapsack of every private was the baton of a general. <laughs> so you never know how that robe is going to affect somebody on the bench. And once we have voted for them, they are on. Permanent? F for life. Uh, no trial but period? But it's 70 now. It's moved down to 70. No trial period? No Let's trial say period. A month of review? No, nothing. Nothing. So the only way to remove a judge is, uh, there's a couple of ways. The Supreme Court can do it. The legislature can file a, an address bill and um, impeach them in effect, and they can have a trial in the Senate. Has that been done in Massachusetts? It was done a long time ago. I think it was done in 1803. That's a long time ago. The last impeachment was for a governor's counselor in 1941. When a, a governor's counselor was impeached hmm. for selling a pardon to Raymond Patriarca, a young Raymond Patriarca, the head of the organized crime. I knew him. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, I grew up yeah. with his son. Mm. So, uh, he was a good kid. That was the last impeachment of anything. Really? Yeah. yeah. So all the decisions that have been made have been good decisions? No. I must say, uh, I have voted no for candidates, and they have surprised me and turned out to be very well thought of judges. Good. And I'm glad of that. Yeah, sure. Uh, and sometimes I have voted no and said on the floor of the council that I'm voting no. I know this, this person is, has the votes, but I'm voting no in hopes that the nominee reflects on the fact that they don't know about addictions. Mm -hmm. And maybe my no vote will get them to learn it. I think I remember when you were on the last time that we, we covered the same subject. You, uh, I think, were the lone wolf in that discussion at the time. No, yep. Nobody really understood what no. you were trying to accomplish. You were like ahead of your time. There's an awful lot of discussion about that now. There's a that police department up on the North Shore, um, yes. where instead of um, arresting them, they give them a choice of, of going for treatment. Right. And they have to make that decision right then and there, or going to the big house. Right. And it seems to be catching on, so I congratulate you for being at the forefront. Well, thank you. And uh, I told um, uh, Governor Baker, I said, you know, Governor Patrick had a nice committee. They issued a nice report. I said, you had a nice committee, issued a nice report. Kids are still dying every day, and we're not doing anything about it. What are we going to stop it? They don't have an answer for that. He doesn't have an answer for that. I says, why, why do we handle this medical condition in a court system? Why don't we have clinics all over so people can go in there with that have this disease and go in and be treated? They don't want to put the money into it. No, I was just going to say, I think I heard on the radio in the last day or so that they, if everybody were to accept the program, they would not have enough beds for them. Can't do it. Like 3,000 beds short or something like that. Yeah, I said, why, you know, somebody goes and, and, and overdoses and dies, it's usually because they buy a product on the street that is no good for them, will kill them. Mm -hmm. And then they're too ashamed or afraid, so they hide and do it alone. I said, other countries handle it differently. They don't have the deaths that we have. Why can't we do that? Why can't we have safe places for these addicted people to go with a doctor and a nurse that love them and want to help them? And if they need something, they give it to them, supervised. But they don't die there. We don't seem to want to do that. So I think there's a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. It's a very serious problem. Tremendous problem. Not just in Massachusetts, all over the country. You know, I estimate, and it's not an official estimation, I estimate there's about 150,000 people addicted to opiates. Where? In Massachusetts. Wow. I'm just, I'm no scientific. It's my own feeling. What, what does that do for them? 16 people are affected by that one person. Multiply it out. Yeah. Over a million and a half.
That's a third of the state is affected. If a person is, is affected by it, what, what, what condition are they in? Are they, are they a danger to the community or themselves or are they just well, lackadaisical? Well, they're, they're a danger in the sense that they do not have control over that terrible addiction. And when they have to have it, they do things like break into somebody's house or steal. And it causes them to sometimes, you know, put somebody in harm or mm -hmm. cause some public safety issue. So, you know, I argue, why, why do we make all of these people addicted buy from some drug seller on the street? Why do we make them do that? Why can't they come in into a facility, mental, uh, Department of Public Health facility? Why, why do we force them to buy it on the street? I said to the governor, why don't we put in every courthouse, since we're going to have the police and courts involved in this medical issue, why don't we have a methadone and suboxone clinic in every courthouse? You bring somebody in under arrest, the judge said, if you go down and get in that program and spend a year in it, these charges will be dismissed before they're on your record. No answer. So how do we, how do we get that to a, um, the point where they're forced into doing it? Take it away from the judge who makes that decision. Make it a law. Well, we'd have to change the laws and politicians would have to come out in front and make some pretty bold statements about what other countries have done where it's worked. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I don't believe we're going to have too many politicians stepping up and saying, in effect, we should decriminalize this and stop arresting these poor people that have this terrible disease. It's about time we, we faced it. The war on drugs has been lost for 35 years and it's been going on for 46 trillions of dollars and we haven't stopped one, one uh, type it's gotten of drug worse. yet. It's gotten worse, much worse over the years. So what's the answer? The answer is to come out of the box and start thinking different ways and stop having these people die, two or three a day die. We can stop that. In, in Canada, they have almost stopped the deaths with safe safe areas for people to come in and have to use if they use. Well, how did they convince their people that this is the route they should take? I, I think they just had the backbone to step up and do it. Other Portugal's done it. Portugal had a terrible problem like us, about the size of Massachusetts. Terrible problem. Deaths, incarcerations, crime rates. Every city in, Ma big city in Massachusetts, my own city of Holyoke, drug selling all over the place. Mm. It's terrible. Why, why do we allow that to happen? If, if, you, if you don't let, if they can get the, what they need in a public health facility, you don't have any drug sellers. There's no more money in it. Right. So that goes, that crime goes. We don't have that issue anymore. But we're afraid to do that. People are afraid of this heroin. Well, well that, that okay. takes it away from uh, what you're at, your job. Mm. That takes it away from you. All you can do is suggest and hope yeah. that the judges yeah. you appoint uh, uh, we'll start looking at things a little bit differently. It, it, does that, is that part of the interview process, by the way? Oh, I do. Every, every nominee I, I go through. And the other seven uh, members of the board just keep their eyes open? Yeah, some of them ask about it, too. Yeah, they do. When, when, a, when the interview is over, do you, do you folks like go into an executive session to discuss the candidates? No, we do not. Uh, we don't have exec executive sessions. The, lieutenant, the, the governor's council is not subject to the open meeting law, so we don't have to go into an executive session. But uh, we will talk amongst ourselves uh, if there's any questions. And the following week, usually, we will vote. Mm -hmm. And people get up and say what they want to say before the vote. And then a vote is taking, taken publicly and recorded. There's been a lot of stories uh, uh, on the media lately about judges and the sentences they hand down. Mm, yeah. um, the, I think the one more recent was uh, the, the sexual uh, uh, mishap of a, of a college student um, with a uh, young lady who was uh, unconscious. Was that the one in New Hampshire? I believe so. I, I think so. It was one of them. Yeah. The judge handed down a six-month sentence over that. Oh, that was out in California. I think. Yeah, I think that's what. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the one in New Hampshire was different. Yeah. Um, so that's the way judges are working. Well, no, no. Some and, judges. Uh, and uh, what 
I say to people that call me about those issues that, first of all, you got to be careful making a judgment on what you hear on CNN or on the radio. Yeah, there's, there's more to it than what you Much hear. more to it. Of course. So if you weren't in the courtroom and you, did, you weren't um, uh, apprised of all of the facts mm -hmm. and the reasoning that a judge gave for his sentence, then you're making a judgment with half a bucket full. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't believe that judges, uh, we, did, we had an issue here that's going on now about the tragedy of the police officer in Auburn. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fellow who did it was killed by the police, but he had been in some courts, three different judges had made Recently some, let him out. Uh, yeah, they let him out. But, and, and it sounds terrible, but when you look at the facts, you find out that the DA's office didn't ask for the guy to be held either. Why? Because it wasn't that type of a crime. It was, wasn't all that serious, uh, the facts of the oh. case. So then he kills a police officer, you know, tragically kills that poor officer. But you get it, you gotta, you gotta, th judges aren't looking at somebody saying, if I let out Mr. Cohen, I know he's gonna kill somebody, so I'll let him out. They're not doing that. Every judge that makes a decision, every parole member that makes a decision is one tragedy away from criticism. Mm -hmm. But you don't make those rulings in the crystal ball in your courtroom. You can't do that. Otherwise, no one would ever get out. You would hold everybody if you had any fear that somebody might do something. So I, I think we look for blame in the wrong areas. The blame was on the guy who committed that crime. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, based on I, a short clip of what's been told, yeah, instead of the whole story, You're right? Yeah, I think so. that Rodney King, uh, I think it was Rodney King, who was uh, beat up by the Los Angeles yeah, police right. many, many years ago. All yeah. you saw was what CNN wanted to show you. Right, they didn't show you all the chasing and everything else that was going on, which preceded it. Yeah. And, you know, which uh, cranks up your adrenaline and... Uh, oh, it gets people revved up, but, but they don't know the whole story. Yeah. And if they had been in the courtroom, they may have had a different opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's not good to read in uh, news clips. We have no choice, though. No, 24 hours a day news. Well, we can, we can probably uh, dissect a lot of stories that we're re reading about uh, these days. And yeah. maybe if we have time at the end, maybe we'll get into a couple of others. But I, I brought you here because I wanted to find out some more about the Governor's Council, mm -hmm. um, the, the history of it. I don't know if you want to get into it. or, or I'll I... give you a brief history and the folks a brief history. Um, the Governor's Council came out of what was known as the Executive Council, which was established in pre-colonial days by the King of England. He would appoint a governor of Massachusetts, but he didn't trust him. So he had an executive council around him, around the governor, to report back to England to make sure the governor was doing what he was supposed to be doing. John Adams, when he wrote the Constitution up on Adams Street in Quincy back in 1780, liked that concept. So he created in the Constitution of Massachusetts the executive council commonly known as the Governor's Council, but its official name is Executive Council, because he said he wanted, people, he wanted a council to have a check and balance on a powerful governor. The framers were afraid of kings and powerful governors, so they wanted a check on, balance on that. So in the old days, the Governor's Council had a tremendous amount of power. In fact, they were third in line for succession. Mm -hmm. And in, in 1800, uh, both the governor and lieutenant governor died shortly after one another, and the governor's council as a whole was the governor of Massachusetts. Well, that must have been something. They soon realized the folly of their ways trying to get eight people to agree on every sure. decision. So they changed that over the years. And there were various changes made in the Constitution uh, to evolve what we have now. And we're one of two states with a governor's council. The other one is New Hampshire. And Out of the whole country? Yeah, New Hampshire was part of Massachusetts at one time in Maine and that. So anyway, the Governor's Council today, the, the most important thing we do is have confirmation hearings on judges and clerk magistrates to our court system. We also have to sign off on all spending warrants in the Commonwealth. 
Every week we get a spending warrant of some tremendous amount of money, billions, and we sign off on them. Um, they're usually involving projects that have been completed, like somebody did a bridge over and it's been approved by every step of the way and now they're waiting to get paid and we have to be the last ones to oh. sign that. We certify all statewide elections. We confirm notary publics and justices of the peace, and we have to give our approval for pardons and commutations in the judicial system. So that's basically what we do. And how do you, how do you make that decision on pardons? The way it works is the pardoning uh, panel, which is the parole board, makes a recommendation to the governor for a pardon for Mr. Jones. Mm -hmm. The governor can either do nothing with it, deny it, or allow it. If he allows it, then it comes to us for a hearing, and we have to be the last say in it. We decide whether they get the pardon or the commutation. Does that person come before you? Uh, they don't have to. We don't have to give any hearings, even for judicial candidates. In fact, up until about 1980, there were never any hearings. Uh, counselors started hearings for a way to have better information about a candidate. Mm -hmm but we're not required to give any hearings for judicial uh, nominations. We can vote without any hearings. So uh, um, commutations, we had three pardons, four pardons and one commutations in the last two months of the Patrick administration. And we had hearings on all of them. Uh, governors have stopped doing pardons and commutations ever since Willie Horton mm. back in Dukakis's era, Governor Dukakis. But up until then, pardons and commutations were um, um, routinely done, hundreds of them a year. Wasn't Willie Horton a weekend su uh, furlough? Furlough? Yeah, and he killed some people in Maryland I yeah. think, or something. And it it kind of hurt du Governor Dukakis. Oh, it hurt the decision process yeah. for anybody else that might deserve it. Yeah. So governors have been, I think, a little shy in granting those kind of things anymore. It's a shame because most pardons. Uh, are for some crime somebody committed years before when they were a young person. Mm -hmm. And now they're 50 or 60 and they live a good life and they'd like to get a record cleaned. So that's basically how pardons were, were done. That line of succession that you talked about uh, was amended, uh, it's according to this information, in 1918? Yes. No more governor's council uh, becoming governor? No. Um, and then it uh, became, what was it, the secretary? Secretary of State. Attorney General? Uh, Attorney General. Treasurer. Treasurer and then Auditor, I think, if it Receiver goes Receiver General. Receiver General is the Treasurer. Yeah. Those are the ones to take over in case the one preceding him is unable to? Right. Hmm. So the Governor's Council is just a unique uh, situation and a, a, a unique uh, uh, situation in Massachusetts in one other state? New Hampshire. What happened to the others? They never, never got well, involved? Well, they have different uh, processes to uh, be, have people become judges. Some of them have elections. Mm -hmm. Some of them have a, um, the, the reps and senators um, recommend people to the governors. Some of them, it's just the governor making the selection without anybody. Which is not really good. I don't think so. I think there should be some review. I mean, in the federal system, uh, the president makes a nomination and it goes before a committee of the judiciary in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And they make a recommendation, but the Senate approves it. And that actually was borrowed. The federal constitution is almost a carbon copy of Adams' constitution. But they couldn't have a governor's council type for the federal system because it's too big. Mm -hmm. So they had the Senate do it. The Senate does what we do. There are eight Counselors? There are eight elected counselors. Also, a member of the council is the lieutenant governor by constitution. Mm -hmm. The only duty of a lieutenant governor by the constitution is to be a member of the governor's council. However, the president of the council is the governor. When the governor is unable to sit, the lieutenant governor chairs the general assembly meetings. Mm -hmm. When the uh, lieutenant governor chairs those meetings, she is not a member of the governor's council and cannot vote. The governor is not a member of the governor's council and cannot vote. And uh, these are representatives from all over the state? 
They, we represent the entire state. We are constitutional statewide officers. However, to prevent counselors from all being elected from a big city like Boston, mm -hmm. where they'd get the most votes, uh, what they did was they split the state up uh, into eight districts. Five Senate districts put together make up one councilor district. So there are eight councilor districts, so we run from, count, from districts even though we represent the whole state. So I run from District 2, which is 40 towns, uh, parts of the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, it runs from Milton all the way down to Attleboro, and then all the way out to Hopkinton, Holliston, Framingham, and Wayland area, and everything in between. And you have to go visit each and every one of those communities to get yourself known and reelected. Sure, yeah, yeah. When I, when I ran the first few times, I put 50,000 miles on just going around. To You're amazing, because when I read about what you do and how many cases you've, uh, you've uh, uh, been involved in, it's like you're in a new one every other day. Yeah, yeah. It's Well, I, I love being a lawyer. I can see that. I love the court system, and my goal on the council is to prevent uh, people. Bad that, judges from being appointed. Yeah, and I don't mean they're bad people. No, bad they're judges. They're not suited for the judgeship. Right. That's what I try to, try to um, evaluate. I noticed that uh, in looking over the list of counselors that uh, seven of the eight are Democrats? Seven of the eight are Democrats. There's one Republican uh, woman, Jen Casey, from Worcester area, Worcester County. Mm -hmm. And you meet how often? We meet every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Or when the governor calls us into session. But usually it's every Wednesday. You need someone to keep your schedule. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, You've been on the council for, what, four years? This is my fourth year, and I'm mm. running for re-election uh, for a third term. We run every two years like a state rep and a state senator. Is this a paid position? It is paid. It's uh, $35,000, $36,000 a year. We got a raise last year for the first time in, I think, 15 years. And for those who come from the western part of the state, do they get mileage? They can put in for mileage. They yeah. can put in for it. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, what, you, what you're what you telling me about, about the council sounds like it almost rings a bell with myself personally sitting as a member of the um, Selective Service Board. Yeah. It's uh, members from different cities and towns, and we sit and we hear the reasons for um, deferments and, and all that kind of stuff, and then we decide as a, as a board whether or not to grant it. Right. Un I'm not sure whether it's fortunately or unfortunately in the 10 years I've been on the board, we haven't been activated yet because there was no draft. Right. But should the draft ever get uh, reinstituted, I guess that's when we shift into action. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very similar to what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so you've been on the council for four years and going for another two. Yes. Um, w wish you luck. You sound like you're very, very, very much involved in that um, in trying to make the right decisions and I, try to I, convince I the I others am, to go along with I it. And I try and I do my best. Sometimes they agree with me, sometimes they don't. It, uh, there's a question here about your voting record. Mm -hmm. how, how can we define what your voting record is? Well, it's a public record. It's, uh, we have, uh, the Constitution says that there shall be a register kept by the Governor's Council mm -hmm. to include in that all of the votes taken and who voted for who and the other business that we've conducted. And that register can be called for by the House or the Senate at any time to review it. Is that something available online? I, I don't know that for a fact. I mean, if somebody wants to know how Bob Juvenville votes on different issues, how do they find out? It's usually publicized in the State House News Service, and you can call the Governor's Council and ask um, for that information, or even visit yourself, and you will be shown uh, the books. But um, I, I also have issued a. Um, a report my first at the end of my first term a report of the governor's council for the two years I was on it and I have given it to every elected official and uh, Democratic Town Committee people throughout the state mm -hmm. um, and that was every vote we took and um, how many times we were in session it's the first time anybody's ever given a report to the citizens uh, by a governor's council mm -hmm. But I am uh, a no vote more often than any other counselor, and I was during the Patrick administration and the Baker administration. And I know Why is that? Because I, 
I just am more critical, I think, of some nominees. I don't, I don't take pleasure in voting no, but it's not a personal thing. But if I don't think the person is qualified or will make a good judge, then I vote no, because I figure that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, so, you know, it's hard for some counselors to say no to a governor. Somebody told me I was the first person that ever said no to Governor Patrick in public. And uh, It doesn't make you bad? No. No. And uh, governors don't like to be told no. It's too bad. They don't like the governor's council. They want, they want everything. To, they want to get everything. But my job is not to be a employee of the governor or to be a rubber stamp for him. Your job is to do your job. Yeah. And if he doesn't like it, fine. Again, it doesn't do anything to me. People that elect me are the ones that I work for, not him. How does the election look for you coming up? Well, I don't have any opponent in the Democratic primary in September. I have a Republican opponent in November. Mm -hmm. um, he's from West Roxbury. I, I don't know. I've never met the man. He's not a lawyer. He's a younger man. So I don't know. He's... Republicans are trying to get some more people on the council, I guess. Get it up to two. They don't like Jubinville saying no. It's too bad. There's a reason why Jubinville does say no. Yeah, there is. Okay. Are there going to be any debates? Um, I haven't heard of any. Should I invite him on and have you both here? You could do that, sure. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. No, we may do that. Who's the chairman of the council? Uh, well, the, the governor is the chairman. Okay. The lieutenant governor sits as chairman, chairperson, if the governor is unable to sit. And usually the lieutenant governor will chair our meetings. Run the meetings. Yeah. Gavel you shut. The general assemblies. Yeah. The hearings are not official meetings. Those are, though we can have one, we don't need a quorum for those. Mm -hmm. One counselor can have a hearing for a nominee. The others don't have to show up. They don't want. Do they as a rule? They do. You yeah. do have pretty much full complement every week? Usually, yes. Yep. What happens if the votes are tie? Then the, the governor, if he's in the building, will come in to the council and become the chairperson. The lieutenant governor will come back into the council and break the tie. And the lieutenant governor has been part of the conversation, so he'll know what's going on to well, make the right they, decision. You, the lieutenant governor doesn't sit in at hearings. And, uh, of course, you see, Adam, when Adam set this up, you would usually have a different lieutenant governor and governor from different parties. So there was a little check and balance on mm -hmm. each other. But in about 1980, they changed the rules and they said, no, lieutenant governors and governors run on the same ticket. So if you get one, you get the other, which has skewed the council because no lieutenant governor that I know of has ever voted against the governor because they're from the same party. So they rigged the system a little, which was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Unfortunate. We uh, talked about removing judges. Yep. It's not possible, except uh, by a vote of the state legislator. Legis well, that's one of the ways uh, the legislate the House would file an impeachment bill. If it passed, it would then go to the Senate, where a trial would be held by the senators. And that after the trial, the senators would vote to uphold the impeachment. What would lead up to a, a desire to impeach a judge? Well, for the, the Constitution says um, governors, uh, judges shall sit during good conduct. So bad conduct, I guess, is all you need to file a bill in the legislature. Bad conduct, so far as... Um Following, I forget what they call it. There's, there's, um, there's a set of uh, maybe eight or ten standards that they have to follow. Would that? Uh, if somebody that was taking bribes, somebody that was not showing up for work, somebody that was um, inebriated on the bench all the time. Um, How about the decision-making process? You're, you're, you're um, voting on a person you feel is going to be able to make the right decisions. If, in fact, the person is sitting in, in, in judgment on a case and doesn't make the right decisions, not following the uh, conduct, uh, I wish I knew what the 
the, the, it's it's something conduct of uh, oh uh, we'll the, have to the, cut the, it in the later, laws of the Commonwealth. No, no. It's, there, there's certain rules of being a judge. You have to follow. You have basically staying down the middle. If you're straying off to the left or straying off to the right in judgment on a case, that's that's not good, and that could be a reason for impeachment. Yeah, but you know, the over basis. the years, I have disagreed with many judges in the decisions they've made in courtrooms that I was in. I'm sure. But that is their job to make that decision, not mine. And if I was a judge, half the people would disagree with me in those cases, mm -hmm. the side that didn't get what they wanted. Okay. So Adams's idea was that judges should sit for life and let's make it very difficult them for, to remove them because we don't want them to be in fear of being removed and they will vote a certain way that satisfies the public. So he wanted them to be uh, sitting without fear of removal by a decision that was correct but not politically correct or not what the public wanted. So you, have to, you had to insulate the judges that were going to make the right decision but an unpopular one. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, judges wouldn't, and there are some that, that are afraid to make the right decision because it's a, it would be unpopular. And that's a bad thing. You don't want judges worrying over their shoulder whether they're going to do a, the right decision, but it's unpopular in the press and I lose my job. I think it's a bad decision that, that they're, in a, they're in a spot where they're in for life because that could affect their decision making to, to an, an attitude of who cares. I, I'm going to go this route because I feel like going this route instead of, mm. you know, maybe I shouldn't. But if I'm in yeah. there for life, I don't care what decision I make. That's true. But every judge that makes a decision is an appeal. Yeah. So you have another judge looking, a panel of judges looking at it. Then you go to the Supreme Court, you have another panel of judges looking at it. So that appeal process kind of takes care of judges that go off the rails on a decision. Mm -hmm. Because lower judges always have to follow the law of the Commonwealth. They can interpret it in the way they wish to a certain extent, but they have to follow it. So like a minimum mandatory sentence, if they said, I'm not going to sentence the fellow to a minimum mandatory, I'm going to give him something else. That would be appealed and be overturned. Um, so there's built-in um, safeguards for judges that commit decisions that are outside of the law. Or uh, the Supreme Court just says, look, we think you made a mistake on that. We're going to reverse it or we're going to send it back for another trial. Mm -hmm. So there's that safeguard. But um, judges that sit for life um, and then they've changed that now when they changed the Constitution to make it age 70. What was it? Life. Ugh. Federal judges sit for life. Federal judges never retire. Even if they can't work, they never retire. They get full paid for the rest of their life. But so we've moved it down to 70. And now with the ages being different, people at 70 are really in a lot better shape than they were back then. So. We're so losing. I, I, we, I could be a judge. Yeah, we're losing <laughs> talent, talent at 70 that could be around for a while. So, yeah. um, Well, it's a decision that was made for, for a very good reason. Yes. I mean, sometimes you might lose a good one. And you had judges that were starting to get a little incompetent at yes. 80, 85. Yeah. Starting to fall asleep on the bench. Yeah. So another thing. But there are provisions for judges who also suffer some sort of mental illnesses or mentally can't do the job mm -hmm. and they don't want to leave, there are, with the Supreme Judicial Court can, can restrict them and get rid of them. What, what are your thoughts about further changing the rules to uh, impose term limits? Well, it's a, of th 70. That's, a, that's an interesting concept and I'm not, uh, uh, I've thought of the concept of, let's say uh, I appoint you as a, I'm the governor, I appoint you as a judge for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Go serve the people at the end of the 10 years, you step down. Thank you. That way you get a change. If somebody is a bad judge, they don't sit forever. Mm -hmm. So I thought about that and I, I think it's got some merit. I, I would have to get some more input from people. 
I, I would never want us to go to an elected system. It is terribly corrupt. And that kills my next question. <laughs> money is the key ingredient to those judges. And I yeah. have friends who are judges in Florida and Fort Lauderdale that are elected, elected usually a a six-year term. And what you usually see is they're good for three or four years. Now they're running for re-election. They become very good. They throw everybody in jail oh, and they yeah. get all this press about being tough on crime and they get re-elected. So uh, yeah, think about it. If I represented you in a state where the judge was elected and the opponent had a lawyer and that lawyer gave the maximum money to the judge and I didn't give any, You're out of luck. you'd probably say, I got the wrong lawyer here. So money infiltrates it in a bad way. So what's the answer, a dictatorship? No, mm -hmm. I love Adams's idea. I, you, you, the governor points, the, there's a control with the council, and that person sits, and sits uh, free of being uh, removed for an unpopular decision, but a right one. The question is whether you want him to go to 70 or not, or whether you put in a time period, I guess, is the only thing. I don't like a review. Some, there was a bill up the legislature to file a seven-year review. Mm -hmm. Judges would have to come back before the council at the end of seven years and get like reconfirmed. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't know whether that's a good idea because you get counselors picking apart every decision somebody made. You made this decision. I don't agree with that. So I'm not voting for you back in. So it kind of throws something into the mix that may not be a good idea. Look, any way you do these things with judges, in my opinion, you're going to have a percentage of excellent judges, a percentage of good judges, and a percentage, hopefully a small one, of not so good judges. I don't care how you do it, you're going to end up with that same mix. Let me throw a question at you that you didn't have on the things that you wanted to talk about. Cameras in the courtroom. Massachusetts allows cameras in, uh, in courtrooms. All the courts? Yes. So whatever's going on, you can see. Well, I mean, is if, it, is if, it, the, if the press wants to put a cam bring in a camera, there is not a court camera system continuously running. So on, on big cases or cases that uh, draw a lot of publicity, there will be a, a news agency will send in a camera and feed it out to everybody else. Why not a court system? Very expensive, number one. To record uh, something? Hmm? Just to record something? Well, what is said is being recorded. Yeah. Um, there's just not somebody videoing the court. I just think that something like that, if they had a camera constantly on the judge and, and generally in the courtroom, it would help to keep everybody honest and above board. Well, I got to tell you, um, the, the court reporter, which is taking down everything said and the judge, and you got both sides of the case. You've got probation officers and court clerks sitting in there. Uh, it's pretty open. Uh, public is free to come in the courtroom and sit and watch anytime they want. You can't close the courtroom off, only for certain very special things. So Does the public get involved? Yeah, a lot of cases. In the general cases? I'm not talking about the high profile ones. Uh, not as much in the general cases, but in some courtrooms, everybody comes in for the first call. They're all sitting there watching what is done. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty open system, and when somebody does something that's in the dark, a lot of people know about it in the court system. Yeah. And they, they squawk. So you know, judges, I don't find, do, do things like that very often. Interesting. Yeah. Counsel, I'm just going to take a quick break here. We've got some public service announcements that we want to uh, play, help uh, pay for the sandwiches that we have. Um, so Gina, can you push the button and let's do the announcements. Hi, it's Gary LaPierre and the crew wants to thank mm, 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 Maxie's Delicatessen. That's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. They're 781-341-1662. American Cancer Society, yes, they're looking for volunteers, drive cancer patients to and from their treatments, 1-800-ACS-6662, or just go to www.cancer.org. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry in St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher, 
That's a 781-341-0611 or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels. Just ask for Jessica. You'll find her at 781-344-8882, extension 2. Stoughton Penny Saver. Our business is advertising your business, they tell us. 27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes in Stoughton. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m., Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m. It's on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. All comments and suggestions welcome. Contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Community Forum Showtimes in Easton. Mondays at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 8 a.m., Wednesdays 3 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. And that too, Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 22. Samaritans, they're at 41 West Street on the fourth floor in Boston, 02111. Their phone number is 617-536-2460. 24-hour helplines for Samaritans. And the number is 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-4673. Samaritans, you can find them at 800 252 Teen. That's 252-8336. Or find them online at SamaritansHope.org. On Saturdays, uh, we started June 18th, and it goes right through October 1st. You have Stoughton's own Farmer's Market. And that's at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Stoughton Center, the Greens, uh, the church at uh, 790 Washington Street. They have fresh produce, breads, pastries, meats, and much, much more live music, weekly giveaways, and easy parking. And to top it off, if you're in the SNAP program, they have double SNAP benefits while available. And leave your pets at home, please. That's per the Board of Health. Get Fresh, Stoughton's own cooking show featuring ingredients from the Stoughton Farmer's Market. They have new episodes coming soon. You can see them on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. Mondays from at 5.30 p.m., Wednesdays at 8 p.m., Thursdays at 9 a.m., and Friday at 5 p.m. Great show. Learn how to cook. Monday night bingo. Monday night bingo at the Ahavator Congregation, 1179 Central Street in Stoughton. Doors open at 4.30. Game start at 6.30. And on the 25th of July, free dinner for all players. So come on down. It's a great game. It's starting to build, and we need more people to be there. So hopefully you'll make it. And we have the information for our guest, in case you want to get in touch with him, Robert L. Jubinville, Esquire. He's a governor's counselor, one of eight. Telephone number is 617-698-8000, or you can email him at jubinville at comcast.net. And we're back, and we have a few more minutes. Actually, you've got four minutes. Uh, if you're in, a, you're in a unique position, you're a governor's counselor, and you go to trial, you, you are before some, sometimes before the judges you either voted for or against. Do you, ever, do you ever get into conversations with other lawyers who might be there and say, who the heck did you vote for? How did you vote for him? Or you voted for a great guy? Anything like that ever pop up? Well, the way it is, um, um, when you go to court, and I go just about every day except Wednesdays, or if I go Wednesday morning, I can make the council meeting. So uh, when you're sitting in or waiting for your case to get called, lawyers always talk about the judge. It's like ball players in the dugout. They always talk about the pitcher. You know, what's he throwing and how's it going and fastball on today. Well, lawyers talk about judges. So even in the corridors of the courthouses, people will come up to me and say, geez, you voted for this judge and he's, he's not too good. He's doing this, he's doing that, he's rude or whatever. Uh, so what I will try to do is, is um, bump into that judge and express to him what I'm hearing and hopefully get him to maybe realize his ways and be a little more polite or uh, be a little bit better to the participants that come before them because, as I say at the council, the citizens of the Commonwealth are paying for all of this. Mm -hmm. So we should treat them as best we can. Should. Should. And uh, so it gives me that opportunity. In fact, I have said to some that had I known you were going to 
turn out the way you are, I wouldn't have voted for you. Hmm. I think I remember the uh, term, I, I want, when we were talking about the judges before, is it the canons of ethics? Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. And those are the guidelines that the judges should follow in judging. Well, the ethics are more for your behavior on the bench and off the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, like a, uh, when, when I vote for a person and I end up before that judge, uh, a judge will usually say to the parties, you know, Mr. Jubinville was on the governor's council when I went through and either voted yes or no for me. If anybody has a problem with that, I will recuse myself. Or if you know the judge or I do personally and we go up and we get a case, the judge will say and should announce, I know Mr. Cohen personally. If anybody has an issue with that, I will recuse myself. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things that judges have to do ethically. Uh, and, you know, treating the citizens is important and part of their ethics, but also making sure they don't create any perception of a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. It's not that they create a conflict of interest. It's is there a perception in the mind of the public that there could be a conflict. That's enough to get off the mm -hmm. case. So there are those rules, and then off the bench, you have to be careful what you do as a judge. You know, you can't be socializing down at the local card game or uh, given to political candidates or all kinds of things that you can't do as a judge by virtue of the job itself. Can you answer this last question in 45 seconds? I'll try. Um, do you enjoy being on the council? I enjoy very much being on the council. And uh, that's obvious. God willing and the voters uh, willing, I will sit there uh, at least for another 18 years, hopefully. Until you're in 88, 50? 88, I'm going to retire. In 88. Yeah, my birthday is next Tuesday. I'll Happy be 70. birthday. I'll be 70. Uh, I get you beat by a few years. Well, if you're going to be 70, then it's all over. Why? Well, term, term limit, right? <laughs> no, God forbid. No, no. I wish you uh, luck on the uh, election. Thank I'm you sure very you'll do much. very well. And uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. We enjoyed having you on. My pleasure. And look forward to the next time. This is Roy Cohen saying thank you very much for watching the show. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye now.